In part 3, we are going to discuss how the Englishman River receives water from the bedrock aquifers, how its low flow is supplemented by the Arrowsmith Dam, and the fact that the water we see flowing in the river at the end of the summer is predominantly groundwater. So let's discuss what we know, or better, what we ignore, about the groundwater moving through the bedrock. As previously discussed, our study has focused on the lower quarter of the Englishman River watershed because this is where some soil layers are thick enough and permeable enough to hold and transport groundwater, thus feeding the Englishman River. Our prime objective was to understand the interaction between these overburdened aquifers and the Englishman River. But as you can see on this map, the other three quarter of the watershed consists of land at higher elevation with steeper slopes and almost no soil cover. So what is happening when the snow melts or when it rains on the bedrock? This is a picture of the right bank at 15.9 kilometers taken during our kayak trip down the river. We observe fractured bedrock and groundwater flowing through it as indicated by seepage. I remember that when this picture was taken, it had not rained for three weeks. So what we observed here is actually a spring from the bedrock. We stopped for lunch on a nice bedrock bench at 14.5 kilometers. At that location, on the left bank, we have overburden over bedrock. We were able to sample the groundwater flowing through the sand, and I will later refer to it as the spring at kilometer 14.5. Look at that rock face along the left bank of the river. This is present between 13.6 and 13.7 km. The location is shown by the yellow arrow in the insert map. Do you remember this photo? I showed it to illustrate the presence of a sand and gravel aquifer at surface. At this location, too, bedrock is visible in the riverbed. The yellow dashes illustrate where bedrock is either present along the banks or can be observed in the riverbed. The circled areas show where bedrock outcrops. And then we have two bedrock wells where water table data reveals that groundwater is moving upward from the bedrock to the overlaying sand and gravel aquifers. So bedrock is really playing a role in providing water to the river and also to the overburdened aquifers. We are now going to briefly discuss the dynamic of the river flow. The Water Survey of Canada operates a gauging station at the Orange Bridge, two kilometers upstream from the estuary. At this location, the discharge rate of the river fluctuates between 400 cubic meter per second and one cubic meter per second, as shown by the graph illustrating the instant discharge rate of the river throughout the year. During a winter storm at 400 cubic meters per second, it takes six seconds to fill an Olympic swimming pool. At the end of summer, when the river flows at one cubic meter per second, it would take 42 minutes 
quite a range of discharge rates. The average discharge rate over the year is 13.7 cubic meter per second with monthly averages in the order of 25 cubic meter per second in the winter month. The lowest average monthly rates are in August and September at 1 cubic meter per second. The Arrowsmith Dam is located at the base of a small valley way up in the watershed. It has been built to provide potable water and also to maintain a minimum low flow in the river according to fisheries requirements. The graphs show in blue the Englishman River low flows in the summer of 2009 and 2010 and for the same periods, the water released by the Arrowsmith Dam in order to maintain the low flows. Historically, prior to the dam, extreme low flows would drop below 0.5 cubic meter per second. So now, we have some information on the estimated flux through the aquifers and the observed flow in the river. How do they relate? This graph is a conceptual illustration of the type of water flowing in the river as we travel from its source, 35 kilometers from the foreshore, down to its estuary. This illustrates the situation under low flow conditions at the end of summer in percentage. It has not rained for many weeks, therefore any rainwater runoff has long been drained to the ocean. We have three types of water getting into the river. Water traveling through the fractures in bedrock, water coming from the sand and gravel aquifers, and water released from the Arrowsmith Dam. From the top of the ridge to the outlet of the dam, the Englishman River receives its water solely from the bedrock. At 32 kilometers, it gets a large flux of water released from the dam. Then, between the dam and 16.5 kilometers, the percentage of water originating from the bedrock aquifers increases due to an increasing area of the watershed contributing to the drainage and the direct contact between the Englishman River and the bedrock. At 16.5 kilometers, it is estimated that 30% of water flowing in the river comes from the bedrock and the remaining 70% originates from the dam. The 30% value is not pulled from the sky. Preliminary numerical modeling of the aquifers was completed in 2004 between the Englishman River and the Little Qualicum River. And this is the lateral flux that we estimated was required along its upstream boundary in order to calibrate the water balance in the modeled area. At 16.5 km, we start encountering the overburden aquifers that gradually, as we travel downstream, provide water to the Englishman River. When the river reaches its estuary, we estimate that over 25% of its water comes from the sand and gravel aquifers, over 30% comes from the bedrock, and the balance is provided by the Arrowsmith Dam. 